I'm going to come from a little bit of a different uh, slant while I do this discussion. I do a lot of pain management in my role at Epworth um, as for my sins. And um, one of the things that always strikes me is that the ramifications of pain are, are enormous. And that counts for anyone who's uh, got chronic pain. We'll talk, we often talk about acute pain, but the most disabling aspect of... Um, Sorry, you can all smile. Um, the most disabling aspect is in the, in the field of persistent chronic pain. So a couple of, co couple of, couple of comments we're going to aim to do. We need to uh, make sure that we define the causes of the pain and then we can target our treatment. Sometimes we won't find the cause. And we have to be clear that in a polio survivor situation, we have a relatively unique issue, not only with uh, the the muscle weakness and pain, but also the altered biomechanics that haven't just been there, they've been there for a number of years. And it makes the, the challenge a little more interesting. Um, pain is perceived by the person, it's it's person's experience, only they perceive it. We try to interpret what they're telling us. But you've got to understand that there are lots and lots of influences here when pain is, is there. It's the unique person's uh, aspect. So it was mentioned before by Marnie about PTSD, growing up, um, being put away in, in, uh, in hospitals away from family and like, and how ch challenging that can be. So that's going to provide an experience that's unique to that person. I have, a, I have one of my polio survivors that if I pull out my plessa, which is a tendon hammer, she rears back in fear because that was such a traumatic experience for her. So those, those, those impact enormously on a person's uh, understanding of their pain. What symptoms do they have? Do they have other pathologies? And Marnie listed a number of other things that can occur to a polio survivor beyond those effects of polio. What's their belief about their pain? Do they believe that they're going to end up in a wheelchair because of their pain? Do they believe that there's trauma going on to the tissues? How do they manage this? You polio survivors out there, hands up. How many of you have a relaxed attitude to life? Keep your hands up. I don't believe you. <laughs> the reason for that is that when you had your polio, you strive to be normal. That's my next question. What's normal? I have no idea what normal is. What you wanted to do was achieve. So you are achievers getting to this point in your life. You work by working harder. So the first time you get pain, you ignore it and work harder because it's, a, it's, a, it's an interference in your lifestyle. So that's often the approach we find in a polio survivor. So as a rehab physician, I'm trying to often get people going again Sometimes I've got to slow you guys down. It's a real, real change in the way you mention things, uh, manage things. Uh, comment for you. Patients with fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome, they come to me and say, you've got to help me. Polio survivors come to me and say, you've got to help me help myself. Totally different management strategy. And that really influences how we manage pain. Comes into all the psychology of it. Do you get frustrated? Are you anxious about what's happening to you? What are your cultural as, as, uh, issues? And where does this fit in? Is it affected work, family, sport, quality of life? All those things come into play. But as I said at the bottom there, pain is what the patient says it is and that's what we've got to target. I don't like the term treated much. I've got it there. I prefer the term managed. So, quickly, we'll just go through a couple of aspects of pain because this gives us a foundation on what we're working with. So. Persistent pain, it's where you have this unpleasant sensory and emotional experience and there may be tissue damage or there may not be, but it's perceived as such. And it continues for longer than expected. So, persistent pain, it's a chronic pathological process. Like post-polio syndrome is a neurological process, so is pain. It's driven by the nervous system. You do not necessarily find any pathology associated with the pain. And this is where one of the challenges come into play. But the psychology of it all and the management strategies are quite challenging. You often see people change because they've had their pain for such a long time. Their wives will say, it's not the man I married. Or they lose their job or they lose their friends. They become more isolated. If you can find an underlying cause, you target it, but often you can't. That's different to what we, we normally think of pain, is any time you see pain on the television, it's about an acute pain situation where someone suddenly gets injured. And you can find the injury, you can target the injury, there's often neurological change associated with it, and you can target. So it's a lot easier to target um, acute pain. 
But you can have both acute and chronic pain occurring together, or persistent pain and chronic occurring together. The dif difference is with an acute pain, we, we, th we believe we can fix it. With ongoing persistent or chronic pain, there's no cure. We've got to manage it. All right, so polio survivor. Um, if you read the, the various literature, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, managing the, the just the actual polio s scenarios. But really when we're managing someone in the clinic, it's about the whole person. But the, things tend to fall into three areas. There's the post-polio syndrome, which I tend to think of a muscular neuro neurogenic type process, overuse where there's a, a, an ergonomics uh, overactivity situation when you're wearing out, and then the biomechanical uh, effects of the late effects of polio. I put this slide up. I'm not going to go through the definition of post-polio syndrome. Marnie really cleared a lot of things up this morning. But the primary symptoms of fatigue, pain and weakness are prominent. And so the second highest feature in someone with post-polio syndrome is pain. But you've got a problem. And the problem is that over half the people who have been exposed to polio or have post-polio syndrome will have these symptoms, but they not, may not be, oh, sorry, polio survivors have these symptoms, but they may not have post-polio syndrome. Who's a parent here? You've been tired, you've been sore, you feel exhausted and weak. These are aspects of all our lives, it's how we manage them. I, I do charge, challenge Marnie a little bit in terms of the neuromuscular pain, as you can see. I do think you get dysesthesia or burning pain where you get neuromuscular junction problems associated with polio, but it's not always there. You get cramps though, and that deep, dull ache that truly really drives you crazy. You often find these features are more prominent after activity at the end of the day when fatigue sits in. Remembering that fatigue and pain like working together and it's not always in a positive way. So when you actually look at managing the, uh, the symptoms, you look at trying to decrease the burden or load, so decrease the activity levels and adjust the activities, maybe put orthotics or equipment in place to assist with energy conservation. You can try simple analgesia and sometimes you might try neuromodulation, which are, includes antidepressants or anti-seizure medications. The medications generally aren't that great. And one of the problems when you use medications to manage neural pain, nerve pain, is they're not specific for the nerve pain. They affect the whole neural tree. So someone on a medication that's trying to adjust for nerve pain affects their thinking, their alertness, their vision, their taste, they have a dry mouth, weight gain, whole range of things come into play. And often they feel just blah on them. Do you know what blah is? It's, that it's one of those indefinable things, but it's a really good description of how people can feel. So medications generally aren't your first thought. And you'll notice as I go through the talk that I tend to pull away from medicines a bit. Then we talk about the biomechanical pain. I'll put overuse in here because it really is one of those forms. But this can affect both, the, uh, it can impact upon both the affected and non-affected limbs. It's generally due to biomechanical dysfunction or inefficiency or postural malalignment. And you get, with time, major orthopaedic and musculotendinous uh, discrepancies which create greater pressures on various parts of the body which are overloaded. And that leads into your overuse injuries. Don't forget you can get underuse issues as well in the limbs that have been affected where people don't use them as much as they should as well. So the person is ergonomically inefficient. And um, one of the classic examples there is uh, when you when you have an affected lower limb, you may be putting 70% of your weight bearing through the, the good leg and 30% through the affected leg. And with time, that good leg wears out and then you've got a problem. Compounding this is what I talked about earlier. The psychology of managing the polio survivor is your desire to achieve. Your driven personality. So... You don't want to know about this slowing you down. You're going to keep going harder and harder. It's great fun to work with. And we've also got to remember that as we mature, and I prefer that word too, Marnie, <laughs> um, things don't work as well as they used to. And, they, and then if you're trying to push things that don't work as well as they used to, you get injury. 
So the management targets decreasing the stress on the joints and soft tissues. Look at postural realignment, either by physical re-education or orthotics and improving the biomechanics. So we use physical therapy, orthotics, equipment adjustment, home and work modifications. An occupational therapist is so valuable in looking at what's happening at home at work. Sometimes they can be redefined as occupational terrorists when they turn your world upside down, but they are invaluable. And you've got to avoid this concept of no pain, no gain. You don't have to hurt to succeed. And remembering now that ortho there'll be discussions through the conference about surgery, but orthopaedics has come a long way, as have anaesthetics. And there are surgical options available now. When I started seeing polio survivors too many years ago, we didn't do resisted exercises, we didn't do surgery. The world's a different place now. I pick my surgeons and I pick my patients and we get good outcomes. Okay, common sites. The, the, affected, the so called affected muscle, remembering that the initial infection is a total body experience. So all muscles are affected, but we're looking at those that we actually can uh, identify. So the, the affected muscle and nerves. You talk about the soft tissue strains, you might get tendonitis, trochanteric bursitis. So hip pain is really common. Um, and then ligaments in hands and feet, for example. And then you get your wear and tear on your shoulders because they're not made to weight bear, uh, as aren't elbows, and wrists and thumbs. Um, and effects on opposite hips and knees, for example. Degenerative change occurs in the back, the neck, shoulders, hips, knees, hands and feet. So if you get headache associated with polio, it's not actually polio, it's actually the wear and tear that occurs in the neck and that's called cervicogenic. And you may get, uh, Marley, Marley was uh, mentioning radicular type pains where you get pressure on the nerves as they're coming out of the spine because of degenerative change in the spine. So it's a secondary or tertiary effect. So they're the radiculopathy that you may see. And then also with overuse, particularly in hand with carpal tunnel syndrome or um, ulnar nerve entrapment, but it can also happen in the feet where you get metatarsalgia and things like that occurring as well. So why is it worth thinking about trying to manage pain because it really does affect a person's quality of life. People who are happy-go-lucky may turn into miserable, sad old individuals. So you want to try and get in there early. So you want to look at their physical well-being, their psychological well-being, their social well-being, and also, it's not something we tend to emphasise in medicine, but there's a role for spiritual well-being as well because that allows a person to have hope. So all these things need to be addressed. Because someone comes in and says they've got pain, just doesn't mean you just give them an Aspro and send them to bed. Aspro, for those younger people, was a tablet that we used to use in the 60s, but we're a bit older than it now. We use Panadol, Osteo. <laughs> so, if you're gonna try and manage pain, you've gotta think about positive and negative influences. We like to think more on positive influences, and we try and get in early, so we assess appropriately set up the treatment and support, try and give early pain relief and get patient back going. The, treating, the treater needs to acknowledge the person. One of the greatest difficulties in managing pain is the old comment, it's all in your head. Has anyone ever had that said to them? Okay, some of it is in your head, I'm sorry, because the psychological dynamics of, ma of pain and its generation involve the nerve tracks going up into the brain. But that's not the primary cause. When you set out to try and manage, you need to be realistic. So you don't set up people to fail. You give them challenges that they're going to be able to achieve. And you try and adjust the way they adapt to stresses. You certainly don't be punitive. You, you, you encourage people to manage as well as possible. You try and get the family supporting and the environment supporting them minimise conflict and try and get them feeling like they're achieving. This, this busy slide, simple answer. Acute pain, bang, we do it, we get on with it. Persistent pain, we've got challenges, we have to take our time, we have to work through methodology to make this situation better. 
So when we look at the psychology of it all, and some of, some of you know about the term cognitive behavioural therapy, first we have to address the fears and encourage as much as we can resumption of previous normal duties. Put in, then we put in uh, place strategies and activities to improve their limitations, so physical exercise, orthotics and life, and where it's affecting their vocational, community access, interpersonal, put in support and management. Now, because you're seeing a psychologist doesn't mean you're mad. And this is one of the problems that a lot of patients go and see a psychologist and they get interviewed and they think they're going through a rebirthing experience once again. What it's about is giving a person the strategies to cope on a bad day and on a good day. You're able to say I'm not going well, you're able to say I'm going well. But within those two frameworks, there are things that need to be done. And so on a bad day, you want to be knowing that, you want to know that you're still trying to do things. But on a good day, you do things, but you don't go over the top. And if you do go over the top, you expect the next couple of days not to be great. So, when we look at uh, disability prevention and management, we need to put in, put in place uh, strategies that will prevent further damage or injury, pick up where the problems are and intervene appropriately, develop a partnership. So when I work with a patient, I'm not God. I know less about the polio impact upon that person than, than the polio person themselves. But we have to develop a partnership where we set strategies up and we both tick off on them. It needs to be goal orientated and timely. And it doesn't finish tomorrow, it's an ongoing process. Most of my longer term pain patients, I say to them that you're a two year project. Because if they expect walking out of the office the first time seeing me, that they're gonna be fixed, I've failed. Two things I hate when I first see a patient, them saying to me, I've Googled you, or you're my last hope doc. Because if I'm their last hope, And the whole process involves respect and dignity. We're human, we've got to interact. In the, in the ideal world, and I acknowledge that I am working in a very well-funded well society where things are a lot easier for me, but in an ideal world when you're managing pain, you have a team. And the team, the critical to the team are the patient, the family and their, or carer, and then the then the uh, allied health and medical. They all have a role. And you may use other members as well. So when we're doing pain management, it works on a rehab model to enable people again. What, is, what are your goals? The first thing you need to do is help the patient understand what's happened to them. Then once they've got that, you can start looking at their physical functioning, working them on their perceived level of pain and suffering, and sometimes what happens in medicine is we treat patients for suffering, not for pain. So we treat their distress rather than their pain. And we've got to be careful because patients often get over-medicated. Um, we need to put in place strategies to cope with the associated disability and distress. And ultimately, we want the person to take responsibility for themselves. So as a rehab physician, if someone becomes dependent on me, I've failed. And as part of that, we try and educate the GP or the other therapists who are involved in the management to minimise the, the distress that occurs with further consultations down the track. As part of patient education, we talk about the known causes of pain, what we're assessing, how we're assessing and why we're doing it and what the goals are and what the expectation of what we're doing is. What other options there may be and is there a role for drugs? But mo most importantly, what can the patient do for themselves? It's good for a patient to have a pain diary because it gives them an idea of their activity levels. And if you think about when we reflected on uh, post-polio pain versus biomechanical pain, it occurs in different ways. And you get an idea of when the pain's at its worst, when patients need to back off or where they can do a little more and when they need intervention. So you assess the severity of their pain, the behaviour of the pain over the day, what makes it better or worse, how does it impact upon their sleep, do they require medication for it? And how does it, how does it uh, impact on how they interact with others? So in therapy prescription, we look at the diagnosis. What are our precautions? What do we want to avoid? What are we setting up to achieve? 
what therapies are we going to provide, how often will we do it, and when, when do we re-evaluate. And re-evaluation is really important. So, we know that pain can be reduced by altering biomechanics, changing lifestyle, so pulling back a little bit, putting in practice rest, plot, rest um, time for rest, uh, time for exercise, adapting kitchens, bathrooms, um, and decreasing activity with time. Knowing that as we get older, we decrease our activity as well. We tend to do it subconsciously. When we talk about pain management, we talk about the physical activities, the cognitive activities, so thinking about what you're doing and the psychological strategies to cope on a day-to-day -day basis. Patients can use um, hot and cold, have massage, interferential, that's the thing with all the lights and I'm not sure it works that well, but it's worth thinking about. Ultrasound can help and so can TENS. Looking at protecting joints with orthotics, stabilising back, hips, knees, and then looking at various physical activities such as stretching, range of motion, and looking at the way people walk, and uh, back care. So we tend to focus on aerobic and endurance type activities, but there is a role for lighter um, resistant activities. We educate about ergonomics, so setting up appropriately, minimising the stress on the joints, the energy requirements, and putting in place pacing. I remember, um, oh, this is a question. How, have you have, how many of you have a cleaner at home? How many of you tidy up the house before the cleaner comes? <laughs> Excellent. That's what I thought. It's the, the understanding that the cleaner's there to do the heavy things and you do the icing on the cake. That's, that's the way you should approach it. But you feel so guilty if someone comes into your house and it's untidy. Um, looking at uh, uh, counselling and support, so the concept of PTSD, it's something that's undervalued in, in, in polio survivors. What you went through. Um, how you're managing things. What do you do to adapt to stressful situations? So looking at stress management, and if you're still working, looking at ways of retraining or setting up the work site, but even working for non-remunerative things like cooking for your kids. How's the kitchen? How's that look? What's, not, what's happening there? Getting into medications, uh, I tend to be, I've got them on the top of the list there, but they're really on the bottom of my list. Because this is really the way we should, we should address, redress uh, persistent pain. So what's the behaviour like? So we look at cognitive therapies and trying to get people functioning again. If they're suffering, do we need to look at medications? But looking at relaxation, spiritual activities, psychology are more appropriate. If we've got true pain, we might try for short-term medication use. And if there's a significant uh, nociceptive problem, that's where there is damage, then you need to look at what... Um, interventions, including medications and surgery, may be appropriate, along with physical therapies. But that's how we sort of conceptually think about treating pain. I'm not going to go into this too deep because Darren's speaking to you secondly, but orthotics are really important. It doesn't mean you're going backwards if you get it, have to wear an orthotic. It's a way of allowing you to do things, conserve your energy to do the things you enjoy so that, so that life gives a bit more quality about it. It's the same with a wheelchair. Just because you go in a wheelchair doesn't mean it's the end. What it does is if the wheelchair, you use a wheelchair out of doors to get to somewhere, then you've got the energy to move around and enjoy the environment. How much better is that than just being exhausted by the time you get there? So you've got to be, you've got to be smart in the way you use things. So orthotics, they improve safety because falls risk is enormous. And you realise that if you're above the age of 65 and you fall and fracture your hip, there's a good chance that you may, may not make 66. So you want to minimise falls risks. Orthotics also help reducing pain. Sorry. Yep. Uh, reducing pain because it stresses off the joints and tissues. And the other thing that's really important is decreasing fatigue. So if you're, if you're using 50% more energy to mobilise with your foot drop to get around, by the end of the day you're exhausted. So the question I often ask people when we start them in orthotics is, so what did you do on Saturday night? And they sit there back and sit back and think, oh, I went out. I never used to go out. Because they've got the energy to do things at the end of the day that they were, but they were getting exhausted before that. So psychological therapies are really important in, in long-term pain issues. 
Most of you will have long-term pain. It's not a new thing. You've battled with it for many years and you've put it into the background because you don't want to know about it, but it's there. So adjusting and adapting to that is really, really important. I've mentioned about uh, not in your head. It's also the pain is real. It doesn't matter what anyone tells you. You're the one experiencing it, so the pain is real. And when we're looking at psychological support, it doesn't mean that we're not taking it seriously. In fact, it's the opposite. We're really taking it seriously because we want to change the way you think about your pain. And that's the important thing about psychological strategies in, in managing pain. So there's various ways of using uh, psychology. Cognitive behavioural therapy is a hip term, uh, but we also use um, operant behaviour. Self-hypnosis, I don't know if any of you have tried that. I can't do it myself. Um, and looking at motivation, relaxation, and sometimes imagery is really effective as well. So just to put this in perspective, actually I'll go back. What happens in the disaster situation or the catastrophic situation where you get ongoing pain is the person has their painful experience and they get into this negative circle and it goes round and round and round. What you try and do in the cognitive behaviour is you stop that catastrophization, confront the situation, manage the situation and you move on. And lastly, but very quickly, um, medications. Uh, medications tend to be overused in pain, um, but they do have a role. Simple analgesics, particularly Panadol, Osteo and like, are very useful for mechanical type pains. Non-steroidal should not be used long term. Steroids have a role in acute back pain. Um, Anti-seizure medications and antidepressants are utilised for modifying nerve pain, but as I mentioned before, they can have significant side effects on quality of life. Sometimes if you've got damage to a nerve or tissue, you might try local injections. You may need muscle relaxants if you're getting a lot of spasms. Um, and then you may get into your narcotic analgesics, which are challenging themselves, and that's another story. So if you want to use a drug, you try and pick the right drug, but it doesn't become your primary care process. Never use a placebo. That's deceiving the patient. Um, we assess regularly because we want to max maximise functional well-being, optimise pain relief, minimise the side effects and engender the best quality of life. So just to finish up, there are frontiers occurring. We know that by, we know that neural dysfunction causes pain, but we also know by that that if we can fix up the neural dysfunction, we can improve the pain. So we're looking at plasticity within the brain. Um, behavioural man management is the, the way to go there. We try and minimise maladaptive, maladaptive behaviour. There may be some psychoneuroimmunology oh, what's the wrong word? Psychoneuroimmunology of pain that we, we're investigating and we're looking at uh, impacting disease susceptibility and progression. So finally, as I said at the start, we need to try and target what the person's cause of pain, uh, understand the unique requirements of the polio survivor. We want to reduce pain and return to previous role, improve function and, or maximise functional improvement but not overuse resources with managing pain and quality of life. Thank you.